Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to part two of this special edition of Real Talk, which I'm bringing to you from the Forget Me Not Hospice in Huddersfield. As you've seen in the first part, we've had some amazing discussion. We've learned some absolutely phenomenal you know, uh, information about the work that goes on here, the support that the hospice provides, and the benefit it has to people like Anila, who've had you know, the, the need to use the facilities of this hospice. Now the hospice, as, we, as Carol explained, is here for anybody and everybody. Although the, the forget-me-not is for young people from the age of sort of pre-birth to 19 in particular, but anybody from any part of York, West Yorkshire in particular, around one, one hour right around, can, can, can benefit from the services. Hospices are not funded by the public purse. They're funded mainly and virtually by donations and support given by people from outside. Only 6% of the cost of a hospice is actually comes from government. The rest of it is fundraised by you know, people doing some amazing voluntary work and also having hospice shops around the area where they raise money from people's donations, but also businesses and individuals giving money in order for this service to continue. I'm really uh, happy to now have on the sofa with me Gareth, who is the in Income Generation Director, a very grand total, but it enormously requires enormous amount of hard work. Uh, there's no doubt about it, that for an organization like this to function and to provide the services that it does, it would not work unless people like you out there were to give it the support that it deserves. So Gareth, welcome to my program. Nice Thank you for you. joining Thank me. You. And thank, thank you for joining me and Anita. No Before you joined us, we had Carol here, who actually did an absolutely um, fantastic job in explaining how people can access the service and what the service has to offer. Obviously, this is a huge institution. You know, I mean, I don't know how, how many staff do you have? Because I, um, when I look around here, there's so many people here who work here. I mean, how many staff do you have here? So altogether, we'll have around 130 staff. But 130. That's, that's across the board. That's people working at the hospice. That's people working out in the shops, right. in our fundraising team. Right. Um, so, yeah, lo lots of staff that sort of make this fantastic organisation well, tick. You know, it's amazing when you walk in here. And I've been here for the second time. I mean, the first time we were outside, we had a visit from a member of the royal family. You know, one of my friends donated a thousand pounds there. Uh, a very good friend of mine, it's an Afis bakeries that I'm sure many people know. There's about 40 of them around the country and I'm sure they'll want to continue to do that as well. But yeah, I mean, this fundraising, it's, it's a huge mechanism, isn't it? I mean, in terms of volunteer support, how important is the voluntary work that people provide for all this to continue to, to, to work? So it, it's incredibly important, as you say, a, a very small amount of, of the money that we need to raise every year comes from what we call sort of recurrent funding, so mm -hmm. government funding, NHS funding, that sort of uh, funding stream. Um, so uh, this year we'll, we will need to raise more than five million pounds. Wow! Um, and that's just to—that's not to do anything different. That's not to do more. That's just to keep the doors open, continue supporting the families that we're already supporting, and, and the same number that we support every year, mm -hmm. which is around 140 families every single year. Mm -hmm. um, so that that five million pounds plus is is literally just to keep doing that work. So, as you've already said, the the work of our local community local businesses, individuals, um, even the families that we support, you know, the, the great work that they all do to fundraise for us mm. um, is just critical. You know, if we didn't have our local community around us, we, we would not be here, literally. Right, right. Yeah. And the mayor of Kirklees, the former mayor of Kirklees, Councillor Masood Ahmed, a very good friend of mine, obviously for his, his charity appeal for the whole of last year, was specifically for Forget Me Not. It was. And did that help you raise your profile within the Asian Muslim community? Because one of the things we've learned is that over 50% of the patients who come here are from the Asian Muslim community. I presume mainly from the sub subcontinent of the Asia. Indeed. So, you know, I mean, I'm, probably there will be others as well. But, you know, we are surrounded mm -hmm. with a very large Muslim population yeah. from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. So I presume most of them come from that, that cohort. Indeed, you know, we're, we're a community hospice mm -hmm. and we know that, you know, a huge proportion of the community around us here in West Yorkshire is diverse mm -hmm. um, and, and so is our caseload. Um, and I think, um, you know, we, we've been um, 
making a lot of changes over the last couple of years to really raise our profile and open our doors to the wider community. Um, and I think having the partnership with the mayor has just been incredible. Mm. Um, of course, he's, he's generated a lot of income for us during his term, which has been uh, absolutely fantastic. But I think the, the bigger benefit, has, as, as you say, been the awareness. Mm. He's been an incredible advocate for our charity oh, yeah, over yeah. the last 12 months. He's been knocking on my door from he, day He one. has knocked on lots of doors. <laughs> yeah. He's shaken lots of buckets in lots of places across yeah. Kirklees. <laughs> Um, and, and I think, I mean, the, the culmination, of course, was the dinner that, that he held um, at Huddersfield Town Hall a couple of weeks ago. Um, and, and I was just sort of blown away. Which by I was the, devastated not to Yeah, unfortunately, well, you, you <laughs> couldn't no, make not it. Not to be able to attend, because if you could see me, I have a big <laughs> pot on my leg. I'm not very mobile at the moment. I can't drive. I can't walk too far. Uh, yeah. I injured myself. I mean, you don't normally see me because I sit in front of a desk. <laughs> but yeah, and I'm hiding it in, in, under this table it's at well the moment. Hidden. But it was one of those events that I really, really wanted to be part of. Because Maksud, Councillor Maksud Ahmed, is a very good dear friend of mine. Yeah. And from day one, he said to me, he says, I want you to be the main person uh, hosting the event. Mm. I didn't realize he wanted <coughs> he actually put my name down on the poster. <laughs> oh, no. It's he only did. when I got the poster afterwards that I realized that he sort of advertised me hosting the event. But unfortunately... <laughs> But I think it was, a, I was told it was a very good event. It was incredible. And I, I think we were, you know, we were just sort of the people that were in the room. You know, we, we Obviously, they came to support the mayor, but they came to support us yes. as well. Um, and we were just so bowled over by the yeah. community support in the room. I Amazing. spoke to him after the event two days later, you know, and I said to him, what you should do is you make this into an annual event, mm. right? An annual dinner for the forgetting of hospice. And... Maxi, we call him Maxi, so he Councillor Maksud Ahmed, he, he agreed with me and I think it's something he's going to reflect back to you. Because I think there is an appetite in the wider Kirkley's area, now growing, developing, particularly within the Asian Muslim community, to s up their game in supporting mm. the hospice. And my role and, and Maksud, Councillor Maksud's role is to try and raise that awareness. And that's why I'm here today. Mm. You know, because obviously you know, I want the people who watch this programme to get an awareness of what this hospice is all about and what sort of facilities it provides to people like Anila, who, who you know, who for, for who you were crucial at the time when she really mm. needed it. And I'm sure, as as you will testify, and you have already said so, yeah. that element of support that you got then is still continuing for you. Oh yeah, absolutely. Right? That, con that that support hasn't stopped from mm. day one. You know, yeah. and it's continued, and it's got me to a point of being actually, you know, uh, mental health is huge. Mm. You know, and the stigma associated culturally with the Asian community not to talk about issues and mm. you suppress them and just keep things aside. This this place allows you to come and speak to like minded individuals yeah. and people who have suffered loss or suffered mm. trauma. And trauma doesn't stop, you know, grief doesn't just stop on the day you lose your child. It continues and especially if somebody's got a, a terminally ill child, mm. you know, you can't give that child you can't pour from an empty glass, mm. ultimately. Mm. And if you are emotionally not well and you need that support, this place is crucial mm. for parents, mm. especially myself. You know, it's helped me a lot. Mm. It's helped me, my sister, you know, because she was there seeing me upset. Mm. You know, and it, it impacts the wider family. Mm. And if I oh, can raise yeah. awareness, does, you, know, yeah. you know, about the hospice and then, you know. Well, you have a different outlet as well, don't you, in terms of, of talking to people. Yeah, right. and there's only, so, there's only so much you can talk to family and friends. Mm. And, th and that's why I think when you come here and you meet another mum, or another bereaved family or a, a bereaved parent who's gone through something similar or is going through something similar, you can support each other. Mm. You can lean on each other for support. I mentioned earlier we're on a WhatsApp group for parents. There's one for dads and mums. Right. There's a walking group. If people want to just get out of the house for a couple of hours, Carol and Tara offer services and come home. Or you can meet externally at a coffee shop just right. to break off from what may be a very troublesome time for you. Mm. Um, mm. And if you emotionally have that support to begin with, it continues through the whole kind of, mm. I mean, I could stop coming. There's mm. no uh, there's no requirement for me to keep mm. coming, but it's such a great place to come, mm. to offload a little bit, mm. that mm. I encourage other people from the community to come and use their services. Mm. Well, as you say, you know, you've heard that from Anila herself, that although, you know, her trauma was last August, the support that is being provided here by colleagues from the hospice has benefited her and continues to benefit her. Absolutely. And she continues to come <coughs> and work here. But in terms of, the, on the other side, mm -hmm. has it given you more confidence now to actually do something for yourself, you know, give something back that into the into community, the community yeah, etc. Either the hospice They're or something else. They're always fundraising, so I always yeah. help out uh, where I can. 
Um, I was speaking to Tara not long ago about raising some money for the hospice and right. it's because it's helped me in such a way that if I could then give back, mm -hmm. it's something that you want to contribute to and right. Islam and charity is good in giving mm -hmm. and that's the whole point if you continue Islam is absolutely fundamental, you know, one of the fundamental principles of Islam is it's to charity. give, you know, where you know, it's needed most. Absolutely. I mean, zakat is obviously compulsory, the zakat can only go in certain, you know, it's ring fenced. Yeah, exactly. But then there's sadqa jariya that you can provide. And that is crucial that, you know, if you provide support to people who are in desperate need at that particular moment in time, who, you know, as a, as a consequence of loss, that has enormous amount of reward as well. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. so what sort of work do you involve yourself in, in terms to help raise money? So I haven't done anything as of yet, right. but we've been in discussions to raise money for the hospice. Mm. But even if we go on like charity walks or just to bring other people into, you know, a look at the hospice, mm. all that in itself is, you know, part and parcel of creating mm. awareness and offering charity. But Gareth, you have stores or shops all over the place, haven't you? There's, there's right? quite a few, isn't there? There's quite a few shops uh, around the, around the right. region. Yeah, How we many have shops have you got? We have 14, 14 charity ten. shops, yeah. um, uh, ever growing. We opened one a, a few weeks ago, in a, a new one in Hebden Bridge. Um, but yeah, we, we have charity shops across West Yorkshire, predominantly uh, in Kirklees and Coldale, but we are sort of reaching further afield. Right. Um, and, and, you know, again, they provide such an important part of our income um, mm. in terms of sort of regular, consistent income coming into the charity. Right. And what sort, of, you know, what sort of support, you know, the stuff that people come in, drop in you know i know people give a lot of clothes but other than clothes what other stuff you know do you find uh, sells well and sort of the turnaround is very quick in those shops yeah so we we you know any any pre-loved items we we will accept we you know specialize in um furniture uh, bric-a-brac clothing right. Um, but even you know books, right. um, you know y you name it, we we take it. Um, and you know what a lot of people don't know is that you know we will sort through those donations and and we will sell as much as we can in our shops. But even if we can't sell them in our shops, we'll recycle as much as we can as well. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not just about the money that comes from our shops. I know a lot of Islamic charity shops. They get a lot of clothes. Yeah, they can't not necessarily sell all those clothes, and then they wonder what's happened. Do you recycle? Do you sell them to recyclers, or do you get money for that? Yeah, so we'll we'll recycle them uh, to merchants, right? Um, and what they'll do is they'll um, ship them out to different countries. Um, mm. So we still get income from that. Right. Um, obviously, not quite as much as we would in our shops, but if if for whatever reason we can't sell them, mm. um, then that's what we'll do. We'll recycle them. So every single thing that people donate, um, we will we'll try and generate some income mm. from it somewhere along the line. So if you have a, a shop nearby, that is forget me not shop or any other. <laughs> You know, hospices, for example, you know, if you've got stuff that you don't use anymore, you don't need anymore, and, you know, it's good in it's good condition, then please, please, please make sure that, you know, rather than throwing it away and going to landfill, that you take the time and the effort to go and give it to these shops. Remember one thing, Islam is not just about praying namaz <coughs> five times a day. Islam is also equally as important and rigorous on saving the environment. People don't realize that. People sometimes forget it. But in order to make sure that we protect our environment, please don't throw things away that goes into landfill. If it can be used by somebody else and you know it's in a good condition, please give it away to them and they will generate income from that, which will help run this place. You know, in other than that, shops, what, are, what other initiatives <coughs> do you have where you raise you know, funds, vitally needed funds for this to continue? So we have lots of initiatives um, for businesses. We have a, a business club, so we have yeah. uh, nearly 100 members that are, are part of our business club. Um, and really that's about like-minded businesses that want to support a charity, like, a charity like us coming together to give us that regular income and that regular mm -hmm. support. Um, of course, we have uh, partnerships with organizations who want to take that a little bit further. Right. So from a corporate perspective, it's a great way to get your, get your colleagues involved um, it's great for that sort of corporate social responsibility piece and mm -hmm. that team building piece. Um, as an individual or as a, as a corporate organization, you can get involved in our challenges and our events that obviously run throughout the year. Mm -hmm. And we had our color run just a couple of weeks ago where 900 people joined us oh, in wow. Greenhead Park. Mm -hmm. So we, we like to bring people together and, and generate income that way. Um, if you're feeling a bit more adventurous, you can take on a challenge. Um, you can do a, a walk or a run or throw yourself out of an aeroplane. There are so <laughs> many things you can do f as an individual. Um, but of course, you know, nothing replaces that, that individual um, support that, that people can give, you know, whether that's becoming a regular donor and donating £5 a month I was just gonna ask or, you, or just you know, a one-off donation. Yeah, I mean, 
businesses um, yeah. who are partnering up with you, you said the 100 businesses that you have, mm -hmm. on average, what sort of amount do they contribute uh, on an annual, if they're giving you money, for yeah. example, you know, cash, hard cash? So we, we have all sorts of levels, but the minimum, uh, so our 99 a business club, which is what we what we call it, um, the, the, um, the thing that we talk to people about is you can support us from as little as 99p a day, right. which let's face it, nowadays you can't even buy a coffee exactly, for, exactly, for 99p. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, from there, all the way up to, to organisations don donating thousands of pounds every mm. single year to us. Um, but, you know, the thing that we always say to businesses is, you know, we want to work with as many businesses as we can from across our community. Um, and we'll find a way to work with them what in whatever mm. way works for them because mm. we know that some can only give a small amount especially in the current climate whereas others can be you know can be more generous and can support us in a bigger way but we mm. will find a way to work with any business that wants to work with us and the business can approach you directly absolutely if they want to. so yeah you know if you want to get in touch with Gareth uh, go on the website go on the website yeah your, is your name there and or is there is, is <coughs> either that or a portal there which says yeah, you can find out how to support us right. um, on the website, either as a business or as an individual, right. or of course how, how to do any of our events. And is that a minimum for a business to contribute, or is it no? But if businesses just want to support as a one-off, you right. know, we, we often work with businesses as a charity of the year, or just on one-off activities and events, and that's mm -hmm. absolutely fine too. It goes back to what I said earlier. You know, we we can't run the hospice without the support of our community, mm. um, and and however that works works for us. Right. Absolutely. No, the reason why I'm asking if there's a minimum because obviously that we've got, I mean, we are blessed with lots of businesses around yeah. here. You know, and as you know, I mentioned uh, in the break, <coughs> Deluxe Beds, mm -hmm. which is one of the businesses that supported you on the, the charity dinner. Um, you know, I'm sure they'll, they'll continue to do that. And there are other businesses that Councillor Masoud Ahmed, and, you know, went to, that I referred him to go to, and they supported him. And, you know, if they wanted to make a, an annual contribution, is there a sort of minimum threshold that you have? Or, you know, I'm sure you won't have a maximum threshold. <laughs> but you Absolutely not. <laughs> is, there, is there a minimum threshold that you, ex you, know, you, ex you would have to make it viable for you? So we, we have a business club which is from 99p a day, and that's sort of the so easiest So is that business regular. club members can make donations yeah. from 99p a day? Absolutely. Yeah, all so right. you can make a quarterly payment, an annual payment, however right. you want to do it, but then working all the way up to what we call our platinum partners. And our platinum partners are, are the you know the businesses that are capable of giving more and at a higher level. What's the what's the average from them? Uh, from the platinum partners. The platinum partners. So we try and encourage our platinum partners to donate around ten thousand pounds a year right, to the charity. Okay. Yeah. So you've got options. You know, yeah, for yeah. smaller businesses, the the, the ninety nine business club is mm -hmm. ideal. If you want to make a, a bigger impact and sort of um, engage a, a bigger organisation, then do you platinum accept partners is good. Um, in kind support sometimes? We do. For example, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking <coughs> of. I know a couple of restaurant businesses. Yeah. So if you had an event here, a fundraising event, they'd be happy to contribute some food, yeah. which mm -hmm. could be worth five thousand, five hundred pounds, a thousand yeah. pounds, two thousand pounds. Would you accept that as well as a part of a contribution? Of course. Yeah. So we're always we're, you know we're always running events and activities here at the hospice, whether mm -hmm. that's to generate income or for our families or for the wider community, um, and and we'll all, it's always our first part of call to look for for that in kind support because right. of course if we can. Uh, generate that in kind support, then we don't have to to generate it. Because the dinner that you purchases. mentioned, yeah. Yeah. the dinner you mentioned, obviously that was yeah. funded and supported by your business as well, yeah. you know, uh, and that that's why it made it such a successful event yeah. for you in the in the night. And I'm sure moving forward, that something that could continue as well. Absolutely. Yeah, but you know, you can you can you accept. For example, you know, we have a, a lot of bedding companies around here. Yeah. Right. Uh, that you know, they they we are. When I when I go out and do public speaking, you know, I, uh, people ask me where I'm from, and I tell them, I'm from Batley and Dewsbury, and people of people in Batley have not heard of Batley, so I tell them, you know, we put seventy percent of the UK public to sleep. And they look at <laughs> they look at me, and that's the reaction I get, <laughs> and they think we are very boring in Batley and Dewsbury. But the reason why you say seventy percent, seventy percent of beds and mattresses yeah. in this country are made in Batley and Dewsbury. You know, you know the Bradford Road, which is the main road, is known as Bed Alley or Spring Alley. <laughs> Uh, because the, that's what that's what it is, you know. Seventy percent of beds and mattresses are made in this in this in this area, and obviously some of those companies may not be able to. Give, well, they will, they probably will give you cash, and they have done, because I know because they're all my businesses. I refer to Councillor Maxwell, and he knows them as well. But they'll maybe want to con contribute. But during COVID, for example, uh, I I one of my dear friends is the chair of the Leeds NHL Hospital Trust, uh, Linda Pollard, 
And at the beginning of COVID, I asked her you know, if there's anything we can do. And I got a message saying we need urgently 20 beds and mattresses, you know, because doctors and nurses were not going home mm -hmm. in order to protect their families and the patients. And they had accommodation, but they had no beds and mattresses. So I rang around uh, <laughs> and uh, I was told that they need four beds and mattresses immediately. So one of my businesses immediately the very next day went and dropped off four beds and mattresses. And then they said they, they wanted 20. And guess who donated 20 beds and mattresses? Deluxe beds. <laughs> Mrs. Razak, <laughs> as I say, is a phenomenal person and has shown how generous she is. And, you know, examples like that. So if you need something like that, would you be happy to consider that as well? Absolutely. And, and the other way that businesses can support us in that respect is by donating to our shops. Mm -hmm. Because obviously, um, over the years, we've had many businesses approach us and say, you know, we've got this stock that, for whatever reason, we've got stockpiled in our warehouse and we need to offload it and right. get rid of it. Okay. Um, and we will take that and sell it in our shops as well. You know. Do you do that with food items, where the, the short dates, for example? No, we don't. We you don't, don't necessarily do those do, in, in No, the, it's in ma the shop mainly sort of household yeah. items, okay, clothing, that's, that's that sort fine. of thing. That's fine. I thought I'd just yeah. clarify that. But okay, yeah, if yeah. you had a business and you have uh, items that, you know, you can donate, or it's going out of fashion, you know, you're changing your stock fashion, your fashion design, etc. Then by all means, I'm sure the, the forget-me-not shops will be able to take that, providing, you know, it can be transported easily and, you know, and people can take it away from there. So please consider that. If, if you have other items that, you know, you manufacture and you make and you have excess stock, again, please contact the hospice. As I say, you know, at the moment we're talking about uh, forget-me-not. I'll be doing programs for other hospices around the area as well. So, you know, you know they, they, they all need your support. So please continue to do so. We're coming to the end of the program. Anila, if you had to, a message to give to our uh, audience, what would you say to them? I'd encourage uh, people who are going through loss or a traumatic mm. time to definitely get in touch with people from the hospice. Mm. Um, should I continue? No, you continue. <laughs> I was just saying, just mindful <laughs> of that background noise. There's a gardener working in the background. He's moving <laughs> away. So if you want to say... Um, no, I again. would just encourage people to um, check out the services online. They've got a whole host of services for children, for siblings, for parents, for bereaved parents. Um, and encourage people from the BAME background to definitely get in touch with somebody at the hospice. Mm. They've been useful to me um, as a service user, as an end user, and I will continue to be that support for me. Um, so I definitely encourage the community to get in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gareth, for joining me. No problem. As you've heard both from Anila before and Carol, if you're worried about faith issues, believe you me, they provide all the support services that anybody would need if they were to come here. So don't worry about that. Inshallah, I hope that you've enjoyed this program. I hope you've learned as much as I have, because I've learned quite a lot. And if there is anybody in your family who needs this service and this support, please, please, please consider this as one of those services that could really benefit you and help you, as, you know, in your very difficult time of need, as Anila has said it did for her. Hopefully, as I say, you found this program interesting. Inshallah, I'll see you soon. Take care. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May Allah be with you and keep you safe and sound. <laughs>